Tov. Good evening. It is my honor to be standing here to welcome everyone to our 17th annual gala, Israel in our hearts and in our minds, honoring Lynn and Len Barrack. As Barrack's head of school, I would like to take the privilege to talk about the Barracks for a moment. Although I had known both Lynn and Len for many years through my involvement with our federation, it was quite daunting the first time, eight years ago, I needed to pick up the phone and call Len at his office. Ever apologetic, I stammered through the beginning of our conversation only to be assured by Len that I would never be interrupting and that there was nothing more important than taking a phone call from me. During our calls and meetings in those early years, Len, our alumnus, never failed to remind me of the essence of what he had written on his yearbook page and no, Len, I did not bring the 1960s Citadel with me tonight to embarrass you, but that Akiba had bestowed upon him lasting gifts, a reverent love for his religion, a sincere consideration for his fellow man, and a great respect for his teachers, and that he and Lynn wanted to perpetuate that for future generations of our students. Lynn is on my phone speed dial, and as it became more evident in recent years, in this time of growing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, that our school needed both enhanced Israel curriculum and experiences, Lynn and I talked more regularly, and the barracks became even more supportive of our undertakings in this area. Barrack prides itself on a pluralistic approach to Jewish education, where students are encouraged to think critically and expansively about what they learn while developing a love of learning. This holds especially true for our, of our approach to Israel education, where experiential and intellectual activities, both within the four walls of the classroom and beyond, including our eighth grade trip to Israel and our 11th grade must trimester in Israel, cultivate each student's deep connection with the Jewish state and foster a love of Israel in a learning environment that celebrates curiosity, nuance, and respectful dialogue. Over the last number of years, Barak has worked with experts in the field of Israel education and advocacy and we are continuing our efforts to design and evaluate our holistic and interdisciplinary approach to Israel education and ensure the implementation of this curriculum in grades six through 12. Our mission emphasizes our students' development as Zionists as we grow their religious, political, and social perspectives on Israel while strengthening their sense of responsibility for being active and committed members of our Jewish community. As we celebrate with the barracks tonight and hear from Malcolm Honline, who for over 30 years has had his finger on the pulse of so many Jewish organizations, we realize that Israel education, awareness, and experience is perhaps the most enduring and important thing we can do here at Barrick. It is now my pleasure 
to introduce Sophia Shapiro, our Student Association President. As the daughter of two Akiba alumni, Sophia exemplifies the best in our Akiba Barrick tradition. A student who, as Len Barrick described, holds a reverent love of Judaism, a sincere concern for the betterment of her community and people, a deep respect for learning, and a profound appreciation for the state of Israel. Sophia. Thank you, Mrs. Levin. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight to support our school. We love where we learn here at Barrick, and your generosity helps me and so many others benefit from this unique and wonderful education. I am grateful to Mrs. Levin, Mr. Stroker, and the host committee for the honor to share my thoughts through a short Zvar Torah tonight. This week's Parsha is Parashat Imor. It discusses the rules and laws which apply to Kohanim, sacrifices, and festivals. In the Parsha, the, the period of the Omer, or the counting of the Omer, is also discussed. Tonight, as the sun sets, it will mark the 26th day of the Omer. During the Omer for seven weeks, we are commanded to bring a portion of the first reapings, or Omer, to the priest, who will then offer them to God. The period of the Omer is very significant, since it acts as a steady path for us, counting the days until we receive the Torah. It tracks our nation's progress on this path and reminds us that no matter the difficulties or struggles we may face every day, we are one step closer to standing at Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah and becoming the chosen people. The Talmud teaches us that between Passover and Shavuot, during Svirat HaOmer, a plague killed thousands of Rabbi Akiva students, the same days that they were waiting to relive the revelation at Sinai. From this it is taught that the Omer period presents us with great opportunity and profound vulnerability. Today, it was right at the beginning of this period that our fellow Jews, for the second time in six months, were traumatized by tragedy when a gunman opened fire during services in Poway, California, killing Lori Kay, Zichron Vracha, and injuring others. Subsequently, we gathered as a school in our dining commons for a ceremony and united to share prayers of sorrow and words of inspiration and love. For me, this time was difficult, but different than the tragedy that took place across Pennsylvania only six months prior. The shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh took place on October 27, 2018. The day before my 11th grade class on MUS visited the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. That day, I decided to go to synagogue. I felt it was my duty to go and pray in a place where not that long ago our ancestors were denied that opportunity. I returned from Isaac's synagogue in Krakow after a powerful service to learn that the unthinkable had occurred in Pittsburgh. We were all shocked and leaned on each other for support. I reflect on both my class's response on MUS and our school's response to both these tragedies, and I'm proud to be in a community that is able to come together and show strength and courage in such a difficult time. Barrick teaches us that we must always strive to strengthen our communities and work towards tikkun olam, fixing or repairing the world. Our studies teach us to look at the past and at our roots in order to build a brighter future. In Auschwitz-Birkenau, after the Pittsburgh shooting, I stood with my classmates and we embraced each other. We stood with our feet on the same ground where members of our Jewish people, only a few generations ago, stood right before being walked into the gas chambers. And we prayed. We lit candles to remember and brought light to one of the darkest places on earth. We prayed for protection for our people and we strengthened our resolve through the communal bond we shared in that moment. We lifted each other up and vowed to be the future of the Jewish people, to never give up and to never relent. With tears in our eyes and heaviness in our hearts, we mourn the deaths of the people who perished in the Holocaust and those who were killed in Pittsburgh. We felt optimism in a future that we could shape, but still the vulnerability in the events of today. Now, in a time of opportunity and vulnerability, during the Omer, I ask that each of you pick something, a small act of kindness, chesed, and make an effort to do it. 
It is how we are taught here at Barrick, and we invite you to be a part of our lesson. In a time of insecurity, it is all the more so important to bring joy and warmth to each other. As Rabbi Akiva said, kamocha, love thy neighbor as oneself. We are the future of the Jewish people. Let us help to strengthen our nation one voice at a time, and let this period of vulnerability during the Omer lead to greatness and hope for the future. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Barrick, and I am a proud parent of two Barrick students, Jack, who's in the middle school, and Maddie, who's in the high school. Together with my siblings and our significant others, thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate our parents. Mazel tov to you, too. Please enjoy the love being offered to you both tonight. Perhaps most of you know Lynn and Len as philanthropists, as Jewish leaders, as passionate supporters of Israel, as key members of community organizations, or maybe simply as dear friends or family. As you no doubt have already concluded, from the many thousands of people we might meet through life. Lynn and Len Barrick are the rarest few who are the truly great among us. My parents demonstrate for us all how the passage of Jewish culture and core values from generation to generation defines the measure of our character as a people or as a community, as a family or as a member. The honor that my parents received tonight merely hints at the blessings that they have bestowed on our community through their tireless work on behalf of Israel in solidarity with former Soviet Jewry, supporting the conservative synagogue movement and promoting Jewish day school education. You see, while living their own Jewish lives, my parents included their children leveraging their roles as young leaders to foster our Jewish identity as a family. For my parents, core Jewish values moved them to ensure that those values were embraced by their children and by their grandchildren. And core Jewish values were embraced wholeheartedly. Core Jewish values run strong in my family. It is true the most important things I know, I learned from my parents. For example, my parents taught me the complexities of how to observe the, the, the Sabbath. I watched them enjoy Shabbat in our weekly life as a family, and around the Friday night dinner table, in the light of the Shabbat candles, or enjoying the Torah service on Saturdays. It is true, Lador Vador. As they learned from their parents, my parents helped us learn the mandate of the Jewish people to educate our children and grandchildren about our core Jewish values. And my parents took us to Israel too. Once we met Shimon Peres, we met a young Benjamin Netanyahu, and we met the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. By these experiences and others, my parents inspired participation and our own Jewish stories unscrolled. My parents taught us the blessings that we share as a people, blessings that are manifest in our lives and revealed to us every day. I will always remember being with you two in Jerusalem, where you helped me learn that the light of the Jewish people must always pierce through the shadows of suffering and evil in the world. Yes, my parents lead by example to define Jewish continuity not as whether our children identify with core Jewish values, but whether our grandchildren identify with core Jewish values. Now the video you're about to see is much more meaningful than I could express with words 
What you are about to see is from the Barrack grandchildren, speaking from their hearts, speaking about what it means to them to be Jewish, sharing their love for the community and the Jewish state of Israel, and their love for Bubby and Zadie. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please enjoy this short tribute video. Bobby and Zadie mean so much to me. Bobby and Zadie have shaped me for who I am today. Bobby and Zadie have really taught me how important my Jewish education is for me now. When I learn the foundation of our Jewish people, it teaches me what my ancestors did before me and how they used that to build the generation of the Jews now. I know what it means to be Jewish and I'm proud to be Jewish and I have friends that are outside of school that may not understand how important it is to be Jewish. They may not know what Jewish holidays are. It's fun being Jewish because all of the things I get to learn, there's all these different rituals. And it's like Lador Vador, if you don't know it, then you can't pass it to the next generations. My grandparents pass down all these Jewish values, traditions, and... Our parents are passing it down to us, and then we're gonna pass it down to our kids. I've learned how important Sadaka is from Bubby and Zadie by observing how they help the community. It's just amazing to like see how much they care about others and how much they have done for our school. My Bobby and Zadie, they helped me with the idea of giving 10% to the school for my Bar Mitzvah project so other kids that can't afford it as much, they can experience it also like me. By them donating a lot of money to Jewish organizations, Bobby and Zadie have taught me that I should also do the same and I should appreciate my Jewish values and it's important that we care for others, not just ourselves. Every Sunday I go and I spend time with kids that they have specific disabilities and to me that's one of the most important Jewish values, tikkun olam, to give back to the community. I plan on following my grandparents' footsteps by giving back to my Jewish community. Bowman Zadie have helped provide the stepping stones for my love for Israel. I just came back from the 8th grade Israel trip. It was one of the most meaningful experiences. My heart was so full to be back in the country of my people. You go to Jerusalem and you get to go to all the kosher restaurants and you get to go to the Kotel and be with other Jews that have the same intentions of you as going to like find that special connection. I went to Israel for the first time this summer and because of them it made me proud to be Jewish and made going to Israel very special to me. Having been in Israel and having gone to Poland, my experience with Yom HaShoah was entirely different this year. It was just beyond incredible. I love going to Florida with Bubby and Zadie, just spending time with them at the Seders or at Rosh Hashanah or at synagogue. And my favorite Jewish holiday with Bubby and Zadie is Hanukkah. We all go to their house and we all open our presents and we all have dinner together and Bubby makes latkes. Specifically Passover, that's one of my favorite holidays that my family comes together. We all take turns like doing different things at the table. And Bubby and Zadie really teach me the importance of the holiday and how I should be thankful that we were slaves and where I am now. By being the oldest in the family, it is extremely important for us to be able to lead, and Bubby and Zadie have truly taught us the importance of leadership. For example, in Passover and our seders, we older cousins lead the little ones. Terrific. Um, I'm Scott Erlbaum. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, and I, I promise to be brief. I had the occasion last week to watch a recording from my great grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. This grand celebration, honoring Bessie and Joe Axelrod, my mother's grandparents, took place at Har Zion Temple in Winfield on October 27th. 1960. This almost 60-year recording 
captured the sentiments of many loved ones and admirers of my great-grandparents. One in particular struck me. My uncle, Jewel Axelrod, may he rest in peace, was talking about what makes a person successful. His definition of success had nothing to do with money or winning an Olympic medal or even graduating first in your class. No, what he said was, the first and true test of any person's success is whether he or she instilled in their children values, those qualities of character that will make them good spouses, good parents, and good members of our community. In other words, can you teach your children how to teach their children how to be successful? This is Lador Vador from generation to generation. Mom and Len, as I listened to Uncle Jewel talk about what defines success, it became perfectly clear that that definition has not changed. From day one of your marriage over 40 years ago and still today, you both have always led by example and by action. Thank you both for never ever wavering in your commitment to the great state of Israel to Jewish day school education, and to our entire community. There are many, many people here today because of both of you, not just because they love you and care for you, but also because many have been so positively impacted by your tireless commitment to this community and our beloved school. By growing up Perlman at the Perlman Jewish Day School, to loving where they currently learn at the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy, my children and countless others are in an incredible position, as Uncle Jewel defined, to be successful. It is these Jewish day school students who will lead the next generations with the qualities that define success, never ever forgetting who they are, where they came from, and what their responsibility will be to help ensure the future of our most amazing and incredibly successful Jewish people. Thank you, Mom and Len. This is your legacy, Lador Vador. Good evening, everyone. My name is George Gordon, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of Barracks Board of Directors. Um, I too would like to thank all of you uh, for joining us this evening uh, and making this a very exciting and memorable evening as we honor the barracks. As I look out into the audience, it is uh, so great to see so many familiar faces, so many steadfast supporters of our school and our amazing students and our faculty. I'm just ex excited to see many new faces, many new guests who have joined us tonight to celebrate our honorees. I'd like to first take a moment and recognize and acknowledge some of our distinguished guests and community leaders in the audience, uh, Madeline and Leonard Abramson, uh, this evening's honorary chairs, <laughs> Susanna Lax Adler, board chair of our Jewish Federation, and Naomi Adler, president and CEO of our Jewish Federation. Thank you. And thank you for your support. I'd also like to extend our gratitude to our gala co-chairs, Marcy and Daniel Bassine, <laughs> Sibby Bloom, Peggy and Joe Carver, Deborah and Harris DeVore, Ellie and Dr. Uh, Richard Englert, Tracy Gordon, <laughs> Connie Smuckler, Gary Rodas, and Cammie and Josh Verney. Thank you for your work uh, as we celebrate tonight. And I also want to publicly thank Alex Stroker and his team, Randy, Randy Buto, Debbie Ritchie, and Rachel Baum for all the hard work that went into this evening and everything that we're enjoying. Now, I have the distinct honor and privilege. We've heard a lot about the barracks already this evening, a lot of beautiful tributes from their family. Um,
But since I have the podium, I also get to say a few things to introduce them um, and make a few very exciting announcements. Tracy and I have known Len and Lynn for many years. But even before we got to know them, we were aware of their impact on and support for our greater Philadelphia Jewish community. If there's one thing that truly defines the barracks as a couple and as philanthropists, it's their passion for Jewish continuity. Whether it's Jewish day school, Israel, or Jewish communal leadership, they take on the challenges we face with passion, wisdom, and amazing generosity. Personally, I can say that both of their insights and guidance have been invaluable to me um, as I have served in my role as president uh, for these last couple of years. And what's more, they don't just come with ideas. They back those ideas up with their resources. They make investments in what they believe in. Their philanthropic generosity is remarkable, not only to our school, but the Federation, Temple University, Temple Law School, and a myriad of charitable endeavors in Israel. But as we just saw on the video tonight, and we've heard from both Jeff and from Scott, perhaps their greatest legacy is what they've built around their family. To Len and Lynn, Lador Vador are not just words. They're a way of life. And their commitment to family and passing on their Jewish values is evident from the leadership role that their children have taken on in our community. And it's becoming quite obvious, and we heard this evening on the video, that the Barrack Erlbaum Sussman grandchildren are growing up not only as proud and confident Jews, but will also someday be leaders in our community as well. So Len and Len, before we move to the first announcement of the evening, I just want to thank you for everything that you've already done for our school, for our children, and for our community. Please, everyone. Now, I'd like, I'd like to invite uh, Sharon Levin to the stage, along with Joe Wolfson, representing JNF. So Sharon, um, I'm honored and privileged to have the opportunity to present to you, on behalf of Len and Lynn Barrick, a check in the amount of $1,500,000 to support, support scholarship needs at Barrick. As some of you know, at our gala last year, we announced an amazing new fund to help make our MUST program more affordable um, for our families, and if we hit our goals, virtually cost-free. It's a unique partnership between our major donors, our school, and the Jewish National Fund. Last year, we kicked off the fund with an incredibly generous gift from the Bella and Max Stein Foundation in the amount of $1 million. That was immediately matched by JNF. That was immediately matched by JNF, uh, and JNF will also match uh, future donations from the school community. In my eight years as head of school, this is the third time that I am holding in my hand a million dollar check from Lynn and Len Barrick. And the first time was actually at dinner at their home uh, a number of years ago. It once was here when Jake Tapper spoke and I got a big cardboard check. But the first time was at dinner and for dessert. They called me to the other end of the table and George, I think you were there too. And I held in my hand a check for a million dollars. And it was like, what do I do with this? Do I put it in my purse? Who do I give this to? How do I wait until Monday to turn it into school? So 
As head of school, I cannot thank you enough for your extraordinary generosity. So, and just, I can't let this milestone pass um, without remark. Uh, with, with the announcements we made tonight, uh, Len and Lynn's investments in our children and in our school have totaled $10 million, um, which is quite remarkable. And on, on behalf of the school, the board, and the hundreds of students whose lives you've touched, we want you to accept this piece of art, which was actually created by one of our prominent Barrick alums, Mordecai Rosenstein, and chosen precisely because oh. it reflects Lodor Lodor. It's perfect. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Lynn and I are honored and humbled to receive this award. We are so pleased that so many of you are here to share this evening with us. Your presence here reassures us of our shared commitment to and passion for our great school, Jewish education, and Jewish continuity. Lynn and I would like to thank all of you, particularly our gala sponsors and the gala committee for helping to create such a beautiful evening. We would like to thank Temple University and Temple Law School's leadership for their financial support of the evening and for being here with us. We would also like to thank very much this evening's honorary chairs, Leonard and Madeline Abramson, for their steadfast support, their guidance, and most of all, their friendship. And of course, most significantly, my wife, who does not feel perfectly well tonight, but my wife, Lynn, has been the wind beneath my sail. She is my beloved partner in all things and is worthy of every superlative in the book. But I stand here before you tonight as a first generation American whose own father came to this country in 1923 from Russia with $25 in his pocket and with so many dreams. Yes, he was among those huddled masses yearning to be free. Had he not had those dreams and that courage to come here, he would almost certainly have been shot and buried in a mass grave as his own mother and sisters were for the crime of being Jewish. He was an amazing man. He worked very hard to provide for his family. He celebrated being Jewish and he imparted his love of Judaism to the entire family. And one of his dreams was to give me the Jewish education that was denied to him because of have, him having been born Jewish and in poverty in the era of Tsarist Russia. He gave me the greatest gift by sending me to Akiba Hebrew Academy, where my love for Jewish learning, Jewish living, and Israel have become and will forever remain part of my life. As I graduated from Akiba and went on to college, my world was forever changed in one day. My father and my brother Jack, who I loved and admired so very much, both perished in a plane crash. And there is no way today to really explain how those losses affected me or to articulate how that felt and still feels today at every turn. 
but one thing is for certain. I am forever indebted to my father and my school for teaching me the values, the responsibilities, and the preciousness of living Jewishly. All that being said, Lynn and I accept this award tonight with humility, gratitude, and pride. But we also accept it with an overwhelming sense of sacred responsibility, a responsibility to make sure that our community's children are able to receive the precious gift of a quality Jewish, of Jewish education that only our school can offer, that they too truly understand the beauty and sacredness of being a proud Jew, what it means to unconditionally love Israel, and what it really means to be responsible one for another. Our world is much different today than it was even five years ago. The headlines are very, very disturbing and even scary. None of us would have thought that the ugliness of anti-Semitism would be so prevalent. Who would have thought that the very existence of Israel would be so inexplicably challenged? The importance of our school cannot be overstated, particularly today. The importance of raising our kids to be informed and responsible Jews is paramount. The importance of educating the next generation of Jewish leaders and passionate supporters of Israel is ex existentially critical. The importance of appreciating Jewish values and traditions is invaluable. This is what my father truly believed, and this is what Lynn and I believe. This is the true legacy of our school. This is our shared legacy, to build a strong and vibrant Jewish community here and in Israel for our children and their children. This is what defines us as Jews and as a people. So I leave you tonight with one last thought. Let us all work together towards a brighter, safer, and secure future for the generations that come after us. The door of our door from generation to generation is so much more than a sacred Jewish value. It is a sacred responsibility that has been entrusted to us by our ancestors. Let us pass it on to our children our grandchildren, and their children. Thank you. Thank you, Len and Lynn. Now, before we get to our keynote speaker, I have one more announcement to make. Creating lifelong connections between our students and Israel and her people is at the core of a Barrack education. We're working on a new initiative that will not only further that core goal, but also highlight another key component of our school, which is amazing and an innovative STEAM program. Perhaps some of you have heard of a truly innovative program uh, called Ophanim. Uh, Ophanim, which in Hebrew means wheels and refers to an order of wheel-like angels referred to in Ezekiel, is a small but growing 16-year-old NGO whose mission is to provide educational enrichment programs to disadvantaged youth in Israel's outlying communities and to empower them to seek higher education and create positive futures for themselves in, our, in their society. The Ophanim students, which are currently third to sixth graders, are all being taught STEM education and after school enrichment programs on standard school buses that have been converted uh, to mobile technology labs. It's my pleasure to introduce, and I ask you to please stand, the uh, Ophanim executive leadership team. Co-presidents co Paul Silverberg and Angelica Berry, founder Chaim uh, Dahan, 
Treasurer Ed Baumstein and Director of Development Rob Meyer. They, they had the opportunity and took the opportunity to visit our school and our STEAM lab today before joining us tonight. And we're working uh, with Ophanim uh, to develop a new Ophanim barrack bus um, and to raise funds to that effort. Uh, the funds will uh, not only support uh, Ophanim and its mission, but will give our students have the opportunity to have a, a full hands-on program uh, to work with the students in Israel. Uh, as a result of the initiative, our, stu our STEAM students will have the opportunity when they are in Israel uh, to work with the Ophanim students directly. And I want to thank uh, Cami Verney, uh, who's an Ophanim board member. And with her husband, Josh, very active Barrick supporters. Um, Cami has really been the driving force behind this uh, unique collaboration. And we have an anonymous and very generous donor, a uh, major Ophanim donor that's gotten us started with a $50,000 gift. And we have several other donors who have agreed to contribute. Uh, you'll be hearing more about this program uh, in the weeks to come. And anyone interested in learning more, um, uh, about uh, either contributing or being uh, participating in the program, please talk to, uh, to Alex Stroker. Now it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, our special guest and keynote speaker. Malcolm Honline is the executive, direct, uh, executive Vice President and CEO of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, the coordinating body for the 53 national Jewish organizations nationwide. Malcolm received his BA from Temple University and completed his doctoral coursework at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also taught international relations and was a Middle East specialist at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Anyone who knows uh, Malcolm Honline knows his resume is quite impressive and extensive, much, much too extensive for me to do it justice uh, from the podium. Uh, and I'm sure you'd rather hear from him uh, than from me, so please join me in welcoming Malcolm Honline. Thank you, Mr. President. I greatly appreciate the shortened introduction so that I have more time to try and address some of the issues that uh, I've been asked to speak about. Uh, I would like to be at the bank tomorrow when you try to deposit those checks. I think it'll be. Uh, and I know that I am in a very dangerous position being between you and dessert. So I'll try to keep that in mind and um, to stick to the time that, uh, that I was allotted. You know, there's a story told about a Japanese visitor who spent the weekend at a Jewish friend's home and he took him to services on Saturday morning, and he asked him about the significance of all the things, why they covered their eyes when they said the Shema, and he explained the concentration, why they bound at Modim, and he explained it. And when it came time for the sermon, the rabbi took off his watch and put it down, and he said, what does that mean? He said, not a damn thing. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so today is a very important day. Today is May 15th which, as you know, is Israel's Independence Day. It's the secular date, even though we celebrate the Hebrew date as a rule. But today is the day, and I think it's something that should not pass unnoticed, that every opportunity we have to celebrate Israel, we should take advantage of, because there are a lot of people who are trying to deny it to us. And so all of us should remember and appreciate, and I will try to talk a little bit about it in a minute, I am really pleased to be here for many reasons. It's very special to me, not only because of the friends that I have here and my long personal association have been born and raised in Philadelphia and I still call it my hometown and I'm still a Phillies fan. And you know, where you come from is very important in Jewish life. We see it so often in the Bible where the story is told of where our forefathers and foremothers came from not where they're going. God says, El Eretz HaSharek, to the land that I will show you. But first, you have to know where you're coming from in order to understand where you're going. And they tell the story of a man who was laying across three seats in the orchestra section of a theater, and a lady came to sit down. She said, excuse me, you're laying across my seat. 
And the guy said, oi. He said, listen, you're laying on my seat. You've got to get up. And he said, oi. Finally, she called the usher. The usher comes over and said, you can't lay across the seats like that. And he said, oi. He said, if you don't get up, I'm going to call a policeman. Finally, he asked to call the cop. The cop comes down and said, looks at him and said, hey, you've got to get up. You can't sprawl across the seats. And he said, oi. He said, OK, I'm going to have to arrest you. What's your name? He said, Max. He said, where are you from? He said, the balcony. <laughs> so. So where you come from can be very important in determining where you're going. <laughs> so being from Philadelphia was very determinant in where I ended up and the privileged life that I've had serving the Jewish people and much broader society. And I had a long association with Akiba, both was my friends and visited often and had many ties. And my belief is that there is nothing more important than Jewish education. And coming here to celebrate those who help make Jewish education possible is the highest calling, to prepare our youth to meet the challenges and the opportunities that face them. It is the first priority of the Jewish community, even before building a synagogue, is to build a school. And that it is a collective responsibility that even those who don't have children of school age have an obligation to see to it that every child receives a Jewish education to educate them, to be knowledgeable, to be confident as Jews, to defy the denigration and demonization of our heritage, of our history, to defend Israel against the demagogues and the demonizers, to proudly proclaim our affinity for the Jewish people here and abroad in the face of all of those who are trying to divide us and diminish us. Rabbi Samson Rofol Hirsch, more than 100 years ago, wrote, that no generation is judged in its time. We're not even judged by our children. We're judged by our grandchildren. Because that's when you see truly come to fruition the decisions you make and the actions you take. We are who we are because of decisions our grandparents made as much as our parents. Our grandchildren and their grandchildren will be who they will be because of the decisions we make. We do not look at things in the traditional frame of time. Human beings are the only species that relates to a third generation. None others do, many to a children, but never to a third generation. It is what separates us. And we as Jews know that we cannot look at the moment. We need to look at it in the full context. I will tell you that the highest title and honor that anybody could have is Bubby and Zadie. And listening to you being referred to as such is the highest accolade and tribute. I wouldn't mind being adopted if you still have room, but the thing. You all, by your presence here today, by committing yourself, recognizing that we need to stand against the dangerous trends in America and around the world. Leaders like the Barak family, whose benevolence and generosity and foresight and commitment have long been admired by me and many others. They have set such a high standard for others, which all recognize and you honor tonight. I am pleased to see the presence here of others who have received so much from them, including Dr. Englert, the president of Temple University, and Joanne Epps, the provost, and Greg Mandel, the dean of the Beasley School of Law, at Temple University, from which not only did I receive a BA, but an honorary doctorate a few years ago, and which I proudly have hanging in the office at the Conference of Presidents. And to see Connie Smuckler, with whom I worked in, my, in the early days of the Soviet Jury Movement. <laughs> when very few thought that Soviet Jews could be free, and we believed, and we overcame all of the obstacles. And thanks to the support at the time of the JCRC for which I worked and the, Ad, I see the Adlers here, both the president and CEO of the Federation, and welcome them. And I have to mention Angelica Berry, whose work I have long admired and whose foundation has done so much good as did her late husband. And Sharon Levin, the president, the head of the school, and to Alex and your staff, and especially my good friend Rachel. You know, when, when she called, and said, you know that you're speaking in Philadelphia. 
I said, I don't have it in my calendar. She said, now you do. <laughs> and it's somebody who I never would say no to because of all the amazing things that she has done and does. And all of your staff who've done really a remarkable job here tonight. So the people who are here represent the scope of your generosity and the impact that you have had and have been touched so many institutions and individuals. And in doing so, you have done so by putting Jewish education at the top of your priorities. Nothing could say more. And the same could be said of your dear friends, the Abramsons, who likewise have given so much of their lives to others, from the elderly and my own family, and were benefits of that, to the students. I was present at the founding, by, at the invitation of Len, at the founding of the FDD, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, which has made such a major impact in Washington. You were and are both visionary philanthropists, and your affinity with one another is clearly understandable. So thank you to both of you, to all of you, and thank you for all that you have done and seeing tonight is even more inspiring. We have much to be thankful for. My message tonight, I'm warning you now, is not a happy one. I was told to tell the truth. I always tell the truth. I know there are many people who heard me 20 years ago and 30 years ago when I warned about the danger of Islamic fundamentalism in the 80s, the danger of Iran in the 90s, and the danger of anti-Semitism in the 2000s. It isn't because we have more information than others. It's because we have Zechira. Zechira is remembrance. If you look at this period of the Jewish calendar when we have so many holidays from Purim to Shavuot, in between, not only do we have the holiday of Passover, where Zechira, remembrance, is the key commandment that we remember the exodus from Egypt. Because only when we remember the bitterness of slavery can we appreciate the sweetness of freedom. We remember on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day, and the word chosen to embolize it wasn't revenge or avenge, it was achor, remember. Because remembrance keeps their presence alive. The day we memorialized the 23,320 young people, mostly who gave their lives for the creation of the state, is Yom HaZikaron, a day of remembrance. Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron reminds us of the price we paid for a state. Yom HaShoah reminds us of the price of not having the state. And the same thing is true for all of the holidays. This one theme runs true, that we look back, but not to get lost in history. We look back in order to look forward, to learn the lessons so that we can spare future generations those trials and tribulations. Winston Churchill once said, the further back you will look, the further ahead you will see. Our sages said it a thousand years earlier. They geared our holidays not just to be ritual observances, but to be experiential. We experience history. Zechira is not history. There's no Hebrew word for history. Zechira is a dynamic process where you look at what caused it and what flowed from it. If you're going to learn the lessons, you have to understand the dynamics of those things in order to be able to make sure that we see it, that we know how to recognize it, that we are able to make sure that future generations are not subjected to the same, we have to be able to see the warning signs, which too often we choose to ignore. I do a weekly radio show, as some of people here said they listen to it, on John Batchelor on ABC Network every Monday and Thursday nights. If you don't listen, you're ashamed, but I know you will, <laughs> that after this you all will. And he has a favorite saying whenever I come on, so many villains, so little time. And the truth is that right now we have so many things that are priorities for us. But they are because we care. You know, there was an epigenetic center at, at Harvard that did a study and spent a million dollars on it. And the conclusion was that Jews have an extraordinarily high level of guilt. I could have saved them a million dollars easily. <laughs> but it's not true. It's not guilt its responsibility. The Jews have a high sense of responsibility, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. When the cops and the Yazidis and the Kurds were in trouble, which was the community that spoke out? After the tsunami, what planes were landing behind foreign ministers with a mug and dove on them while they were saying, we won't take aid from Israel? 
The Prime Minister of Japan once said to me, why are Jews so influential? And I said, because Jews care, and people who care get involved, and people who get involved make a difference. People who don't get involved make no difference and have no influence. People invent all sorts of sinister plots and conspiracy theories. It is a conspiracy, I admit it. It's a conspiracy of love, of arevut, of responsibility for one another. That is very hard to explain to people, why did we march for Soviet Jews? When there were many people who were suffering, Baptists, others, in the Soviet Union, but nobody marched and nobody stood in Fifth Avenue in the rain and snow and the sleet. My parents came from Germany. And I remember a Russian cab driver driving me to a demonstration said to me, what are you doing there if your parents are from Germany? How is he to understand this sense of responsibility that we feel for one another? And it's especially true today when we see what's happening in regard to Iran and the dangers in the Gulf, but Iran's involvement in activities all over the world, and I don't, won't go into it tonight, although I wish I could, because there cannot be a Jewish gathering that doesn't discuss it, that we see the four attempts to build empires in the Middle East to resurrect the days of old for an Ottoman Empire led by Erdogan and expanding the Muslim Brotherhood influence and sending the message every Friday of what they can preach, building bases from Afghanistan to Syria. We have the Persian Empire being rebuilt by Khamenei, who similarly is building bases in Qatar and it's in the Sudan, all over Africa. I was there just recently. And it's the first issue every African leader raises with us is about Iran's growing influence and Turkey's attempts to compete. It is not what the media tells you. You know, Mark Twain once said, if you don't read a newspaper, you're ill-informed. If you read a newspaper, you're misinformed. It's even more so today. You cannot believe what you read. You can't believe what you hear. In fact, you can't believe what you see. So many distortions, so many misrepresentations, a cartoon in the New York Times that depicts Jews in a way that hardly anyone would believe in this age and then justify it because it was a mistaken judgment. And then publishes another one two days later, equally offensive. To see pictures on the front page of children allegedly killed and only last week about a mother and a baby supposedly killed by the Israeli bombs. And Israel said, we did not bomb and we did not hit civilians. And it turns out the Palestinian Islamic Jihad admitted it was they who killed it and paid her compensation. That one of their rockets that didn't cross the border, 90 of them in fact fell in Gaza and killed many of the civilians. And finally they admitted that 80% of those killed were terrorists. Did you see that in the papers? Did you see the story of 6,000 Syrians treated in Israel? I went at four in the morning and saw young Israelis in the Golan crossing the border into Syria every single night to rescue Syrian children and bring them back to Israeli hospitals for treatment. More than 6,000 at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars absorbed by the government of Israel. Oh, you didn't read about it? The World Health Organization decided this year to condemn one organization, one country. Not Syria, not Libya, not Iran, not Lebanon, none of those who deny medical care, those who torture their own people, but the one country that built hospitals wherever there was a natural disaster or a need, or treated 50,000 people from Gaza and the West Bank, let alone the 6,000 from Syria. So we see that there are real distortions and misrepresentations at a time when these powers are trying to distort and create hegemony in the region. And it's the reason why so many Arab countries have changed their attitude. I visit all the Arab countries. And it is incredible to see how we're welcomed and how they talk about Israel. That during the war in Gaza, Saudi intellectuals came out in support of Israel that no Arab country criticized Israel. That they're sick and tired of the kleptocracy into which they have poured billions of dollars in the so-called Palestinian Authority. And they tell us Israel is our only hope against the enemy, meaning Iran and the extremist forces. Believe me, they're flawed enough, these countries. But they recognize today that the source of stability, not instability in the Middle East, is that little country whose name hardly fits on the map. 
that that is what's blocking the Ottoman Empire and the Persian Empire and the Muslim Brother and Empire and the Wahhabi Empire from dominating the region. So we have much to be proud of about Israel. Israel that is now energy independent, water independent, whose economy will grow by 3.5% this year. Iran's economy is going to shrink by 7.5% at the minimal. Inflation will be 60% with a population 10 times the size of Israel's. That Israel's tourism will see almost 5 million people, 150,000 from China, 100,000 from India, 70,000 from Muslim countries, including Indonesia and Malaysia, those countries that don't have relations with Israel, and many more secretly. That we see Israel that is a high-tech marvel to the world. That in Israel, to which African countries, and we were in Africa, as I said a few weeks ago, and all of them say, get us to Israel, get us to Israel, they have what we need. The Prime Minister visited there and met with 13 African leaders just last year. And the first trip to South America, to four South American countries. All of those who predicted the isolation of Israel. That if Israel stood and stood by its rights, that they would be alone in the world. And look how the world is coming to Israel's doorstep. Israel's not perfect. It's not Disneyland. Sometimes it's never Neverland, but it's not Disneyland. <laughs> Israel lives in a real world and in a real neighborhood that is very troubling. But Israel is subjected to a campaign of vilification and demonization that is almost unparalleled, certainly in the last 70 years. And so I want to talk a little bit about the BDS campaign. But I think it's time to take the D out of BDS. <laughs> the rest of you will get it later. <laughs> because BDS is not an economic war against Israel. BDS does not hurt Israel economically. Perhaps an individual factory, it hurts Palestinians massively. The mayor of Nablus called me in the middle of the night at home and he said to me, you've got to stop this BDS. I said, me? I said, you stop it. You created it. You stop it. Because it's the Palestinian Authority that initiated it, that continues to fund it. The European Union gives five and a half million dollars to BDS campaigns and funds legal challenges to Israel to get it to the International Criminal Court. Switzerland gives $2 million. And I told the mayor, he said, but listen, these people are making equal pay with Israelis. They're coming back here, they will get less than 10% of it. They'll turn to terrorism. So I said, take the next bus to Ramallah and you tell it to Mr. Abbas. But BDS is a tactic. It's a symptom. It's not the issue. You ask a BDS person on the campuses, in the communities, do you accept Israel in the 67 lines, not the current lines? They will say no. Ask him if they accept it in the 48 lines. They will say no, because they don't accept the right of Israel to exist. BDS is anti-Semitism. It's just a different guise. It's a way to make it acceptable. It is a way to make it palatable to so many to deny us self-determination, a right they give to all others, to deny us a homeland, the ability to trade free of discrimination. It is anti-Semitism, clear and simple. It is an attack on the collective Jew, the corporate Jew, because even today it's not always politically correct, although increasingly so, to say I hate Jews, but it's okay to say that I hate Israel or I hate Zionists. We can't allow Zionism to become a pejorative. We have to draw the line and so we see that Zionism becomes then the banner for hate. How they say, I hate Israel. I hate the collective Jew. They have no knowledge about Israel's history, the status, its significance, or what it does. And despite its appearance, BDS, economic impact is not the issue. As we saw, Fitch had just rated Israel to an A-plus rating. And we saw a record number of $5 billion already invested in Israeli VCs. We see so many changes, and especially the increases in tourism and visits by heads of state who line up at Israel's door. There are so many indicators that show us that BDS does not have an economic impact on Israel, 
but a huge impact not only on Palestinians, but on the mood of young people and the attitudes on campuses. We face now initiatives across the country, constantly, every day, part of a pernicious and poisonous campaign of misinformation and disinformation, of extremists on the right and the left, of the Islamists, of paid propagandists, manipulating the internet, exploiting the ignorance of our youth and others, and engaging in devastating campaigns, denying the truth, subverting it, intruding and in tried to implicating those who would challenge them. Every day I come into my office and I have a list of the attacks of that day on Jews around the world. In most cases, BDS fails. It says so. The reports tell us it. But too often it succeeds at least in the initial stages. And courageous students and university administrators who stand against the blatant lies and misrepresentations, the campaigns of bigotry, often funded by foreign sources. When the president of Cornell, of Williams College, Professor Hill of DePaul University, the president of Pfister College, these are courageous people in the last week stood up, even against their own students, the threats of their being dismissed, to say that they would not be part of this campaign of hate. But who would have believed that in the year 2019, Jewish students across the country would be afraid to wear a yarmulke, to wear a Star of David, to wear a t-shirt that ex expresses support for Israel on the quads of their campuses, to see AEPI houses under assault, to see professors who denigrate Jewish students publicly without price, to see Jewish faculty who stand up for Israel being isolated in their own campuses, to see the extremist voices, often those of faculty, dominating. BDS is something that is a symptom of a much larger event that is happening in our country and abroad. Sometimes distance gives us clarity and we can see the events, for instance, in Europe with much greater clarity. The fact is that I believe England is the model for the United States. I said it 10 years ago or 15 years ago in a major address that was on the internet for many years in which I said that the BDS campaign will come to America and start like in England, amongst the academia, amongst the elites, amongst the political elites, amongst the creative class, and then filter down through society. Well, it is what has happened. And I believe that the same thing will be true in terms of the political posture here in the United States. That like Europe, we will, are losing the political center. We see the polarization and politicization every issue virtually, but especially when it comes to Israel. Increasingly, we see intemperate views being accepted. We see the efforts of those who influence so many academics, entertainment figures, sports figures, media, engaging in this speech of hate. And we see it then permeating through society. This year, there was a 60% increase in anti-Semitic attacks in France, 70% in Germany. In New York City, there is already more attacks this year than all of last year. So this is not just a statement about the presence of hatred in our society. We read about it, and sometimes we react to anti-Semitism in Europe, and we express regret that yesterday a Jewish leader in Sweden was stabbed nine times, a 60-year-old woman that when we see the attacks on synagogues, but you know that in France, the vast majority of hate crimes were against Christian churches. 800 Christian churches were attacked last year in France. So this is not just a cancer that affects us. When people ask me why should non-Jews be concerned, it's because they become the victims too. We may be the first, but we're never the last. And frankly, I'm tired of us being the canary in the mine. I'm tired of us being the barometer for society. I'm tired of the crocodile tears that are shed when Jews die. I don't want any more memorials for dead Jews. I want the world to stand up for living Jews and a living Jewish state without condition.
when a congresswoman can say that the Arabs welcomed the Jews in the 1940s and gave them a safe haven and it gives her warm feelings to talk about the Holocaust because of it. When in fact we know that the Arabs joined in marauding against the Jewish settlements, destroyed many, killed many, engaged in violent demonstrations to force the British into limiting immigration, and were allies of the Axis powers. The Mufti of Jerusalem sat in Berlin for five years. We see rewriting of history while the survivors are still alive. And then others, colleagues, rise to the defense. It's inexplicable. Ignorance, I can understand. I even understand hate. I cannot understand others rallying to the side when they talk about Jewish political involvement being about the Benjamins. Would we tolerate it about any other group? And these views permeate our campus too. Jews have the rights of every other people and we cannot compromise them. We will not stand on the side. We will stand there and proudly stand against any of these forces. We will not let the bigots, the vicious anti-Semites, the hate mongers to gain traction. The internet is their best ally. The big lie still works when it comes to Jews. The difference from 80 years ago is that it takes seconds. It took Hitler months. They can spread a message around the world on tens of thousands of anti-Semitic websites. 70 years ago, the world said they didn't know. We know from the archives of the Allies that have been opened that they knew every day how many Jews were being killed. Every day, even before Operation Reinhardt, when 2,224,000 Jews were killed in Sobobor, Treblinka, Lublin, and three other camps. They knew a month before, but they didn't warn the Jews. They didn't even reveal it at Nuremberg. And I asked the foreign minister of England, why didn't you say it there? Because they wanted to protect the lie. It wasn't that they didn't know, they didn't want to know. And they were willing to let millions of Jews pay with their lives. Today, we know everything. There is no cloak of ignorance to hide our shame. And it is we who raise the bar on what we will tolerate. It is the good people whose silence allows the haters to get, gain credence. Martin Luther King once said, it's not the attacks of our enemies, but the silence of our friends, which will be determinant. Today, we look at the world and look at the silence that we often see and to see how many people are willing to tolerate and raise the level and raise the bar, dumbing deviancy down, as Senator Moynihan said. And I don't want any more to hear people telling us, oh, we have to push tolerance. I don't want to be tolerated. I want us to be respected and accepted for who we are, for our values, our heritage, our legacy. You know that UNESCO has engaged in a campaign for the last two years in which they have first hyphenated the names of all the Jewish holy places, the Temple Mount, Rachel's tomb, the Cave of the Patriarchs, and they called it Hamar Sharif. They named the wall, the Western Wall, Al Barak's wall named for Muhammad's horse who ascended after him supposedly from there. Rukutab Rachel for 3,000 years called Rachel's tomb, now known as the mosques for her, for Muhammad's driver. And then the next year, last year, they dropped the hyphenation and only the Muslim names. So now in every UN document, 3,800 years of Jewish history wiped out, 2,000 years of Christian history wiped out. And your grandchildren, when they will want to visit these places, will be told, you have no right to. These are only Muslim holy places. The UN said so. And you think, what is it? Why would they do this? With all the problems, there isn't a single Arab country not at war with another Arab country. They all face new intifadas. They all face internal economic and other and political problems. Why would they spend all this energy? Because they understand better than us that if you take away our past, you take away our future. If you cut off our roots, what right do we have to be there? What right do we have to be anywhere? That's why we look back. We look back to be strengthened, to understand who we are, where we came from. 
This is a time when all of us will be challenged in many ways. And it is why the primary responsibility is education. And our primary responsibility is Jewish education. Yesterday alone, there were anti-Semitic attacks in Virginia high schools, California high schools, and YouTubers of 14 years old engaging in the most blatant anti-Semitism and extremist ideology, just on one day. There were attacks against Jewish students on university campuses across the country, and too often the universities did not do the right thing, did not stand up for their students, and they will pay the price ultimately for it. In San Francisco State University, we could not get a pro-Israel speaker, and finally we had to go to court. And a non-Jewish law firm spent $3 million preparing the lawsuit, and we went to court, and the first day the judge said to the university, look at the facts. How can you go into this trial? And they said, no, we're going to go ahead. And two hours into the trial, they turned to us and said, we want to settle, and gave everything. Across the country, Jewish students under assault. Jewish students do not feel safe. They are moving from university to university because they find it intolerable. Well, we will not allow the enablers and the facilitators of hate or the participants to escape responsibility. We will hold to account, no matter their position, all who tolerate or fail to prosecute hate crimes, those who allow them to walk off scot-free. We wait to see, we want to see that the guilty are held to account. We want more aid for schools to be able to protect themselves and Jewish institutions to have the proper kind of security. The community itself cannot afford it. We need the federal government and others, and we need a united effort to make sure that these, these efforts are going to be possible to get the additional funding. We can never take our freedoms for granted. We can't take our rights for granted. Or ultimately, we pay the price. And you know what the best answer to UNESCO is? The shovels that go in the ground in Jerusalem and all over Israel every single day to build a light railroad for an archaeological dig, to build a new building. Every single day. 20,000 artifacts a year, millions that have been collected over the last 20 years. The names of the kings and the prophets on rocks. You can't argue with a rock. Your kids have doubts? Show them it. Show them a menorah carved into a rock that somebody who visited the temple did. And when he sat down outside and he said, hey, I'm not schlepping this home, and threw it down so that we would find it 2,000 years later next to the golden bell from the priest's gown and a sword still in the scabbard of a Roman soldier who had gone down into the depths to go after the Jews who were trying to escape by burning Jerusalem. To see the tiles from the temple floor that my children in the sifting project found, you think anybody or any of them will ever have doubts in the future? Every single day there's a new discovery because God is telling us they have doubts. I want you to be assured, to be secure, to know who you are, where you come from, so that your children will know where they are going. Just as we judge a generation of 70 years ago, our grandchildren will judge us. And they will ask us, what did we do? Bobby and Zadie, you don't have to worry. You have a good answer to your grandchildren. But all of us have an obligation to make sure that we do. Stand up for those who stand against hatred and anti-Semitism. When J.K. Rowling stands up against anti-Semitism, when Madonna says she's going to the Eurovision no matter what, when the presidents of universities show the courage that each of them should have in standing against hatred, when Muhammad Elisa, the head of the Merle Muslim League, joins us in a It Stops Now campaign and goes throughout the Arab world with a positive message, when the King of Morocco institutes Holocaust education, when al-Sisi restores the Jewish holy sites in Egypt, stand up and praise them. Don't worry about the haters and the negative. Don't give them platforms and attention. Tell the story of the positive. Make them the model for our children and grandchildren. We need everybody. We can't afford Israel to become a polarized issue. We need Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals. We need everyone. And therefore, all of us have to engage in that kind of an education campaign. That is the front line in our defense. Truth is our strongest weapon. 
and we have to inoculate our students, and I read all about the center and the curriculum you're establishing, it will affect not only Philadelphia, the whole country, because it will set a new standard, which I hope will be replicated. We do too little with kids who see the television reports, the criticisms, the distortions. What parent sits down with an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old and says, I want to explain to you what that's about? How many schools have classes that teach children at that age to understand what they're really seeing and what this really means? So you have the responsibility as a foremost educational institution that is setting the standards. We see in the studies how low the level of understanding of contemporary Israel is, even in our own community. Well, we have to make sure that that turns around. Because if not, when they get to campuses, they become victim of persuasive professors, of distorted accounts, that we have to stand together in common on our campuses and make sure that every Jewish student feels safe that we will make sure that no one will be alone and we will provide lawyers and defense, but more than that, the communities have to stand with them. The Bible tells us, ask your parents and they will tell you, ask your grandparents and they will explain it. Ask any Holocaust survivor that you know how they read the events of the last months and years. I've done it. And every one of them sees the blinking red lights. Every one of them says, this is the way. It begins with words, but it never ends there. Words of hate lead to deeds of hate. And it starts with demonizing and denigrating and dehumanizing. We all become vulnerable to it. So the difference from 70 years ago isn't that the world has changed. Hopefully, we have changed that we have learned the lessons of the past and our responsibilities to the future. The difference is that we have a Jewish state with a Jewish army and a Jewish navy and a Jewish air force. That when there are Jewish communities in distress in Ethiopia, in Iraq, in Iran, in Yemen, in Syria, in Russia, they could be saved. I had a privilege of being involved in all of those. And I can tell you that while we all can take credit, the fact is that it was the existence of a Jewish state that would take them and put its resources behind it that made it possible. No more Jews of silence. No more Jews who are kept silent. We have to make sure that informed young Jews will be able to stand up to the defamers and say no more. It stops now. There will be many allies, but only if we are on the forefront, just as was true in the Soviet Jewry movement and in movements for all others. And for those who think this is a negative message, you know the prophets were often called prophets of doom. It's not true. They were prophets of hope. You just had to read the message right. What is depressing is ignorance. Knowledge is empowering. Knowing what the challenges are enables you to deal with them, to confront them and meet our responsibilities to future generation. And I want to close by saying there is one precondition in all of Jewish history. For every great miracle that has occurred to us, for every great success and the way to counter every challenge, and that's achdut, unity. When we stand together, there's nothing we can't accomplish. When we are pitted against each other, every challenge is too great. And if we stand together, others will join us. Others will stand with us. This week's Torah reading says, we are hafta l'reacha kamocha. That this is the core of Jewish life. The whole of Torah is summed up. That you love your neighbor like yourself. 36 times it says you have to love the stranger. Because the Torah understands that it's not always human nature. That you have to overcome the resistance. Well, we can have great pride in our past in our history, in our traditions. This war against the Jewish faith, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, the Jewish past, and the Jewish future will not succeed. When you have institutions like the Barak Academy and this new community center that you're building, we all have to support the schools and, our institu our, and institutions. We need forward-thinking approaches to assure that those future generations of leaders like the Baraks who love Israel, who love Judaism, who love the Jewish people, who are committed to a better society, 
and see our responsibility to the broader world, that we stand together. You know, when Noah built the ark, and he put hippopotami and elephants and everything on those planks of wood, he knew it couldn't support him. It's not possible. It was a miracle. So if God was doing the miracle already, frankly, why didn't he just build the ark? It would have saved a lot of time. <laughs> the answer is God wants us to do our part. God is doing miracles for us every single day. Can anybody explain the existence of Israel as anything less than a miracle? Do you get up in the morning and say, is it still there when you give the array of weapons of nations of threats against it? Do you think of what we have accomplished and where we stand in the world? We, this, the thing that distinguishes us from the generation of 70 years ago is that ours is the generation of miracles. The problem is we take them for granted, and then they don't continue. We have to step back and appreciate the miracles and make sure they continue for our children and grandchildren, to make sure that we protect them, that we build the kind of world that will assure them safety and security so that when they look back, they will praise you and they will thank you for making it a better world for them.